Hi, my name is Gary Heilig, and I'm a retired horticulture agent from Michigan State University Extension, and I'd like to welcome you to starting your own home orchard class. While working for Michigan State University in Ingham County, I was a horticulture educator specializing in fruit and vegetable production, where I worked for 34 years. I had both commercial and consumer responsibilities. On my property, I have a small orchard. I grow my own strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, and we have planted some grapes. So I have practical experience in growing most of these things. And for many years, we went to the farmer's markets to sell excess produce. I also have a YouTube channel called Get Growing with Gary Heilig, or you can just search on Google or some other search engine under my name, Gary Heilig, and it should get you to my channel. Now, this class is designed for beginners. And when I was working for Extension, we uh, taught a class, or I should say I taught a class called the Home Fruit School. And I did most of the teaching, but I had some other colleagues come in and do pruning demonstrations and other things. So what we're going to do is handle this class as if you don't have any knowledge about growing fruits, specifically tree fruits in this class, and we'll take you step by step through everything from selecting what to grow to the cultural care such as fertilization, pruning, watering, weed control, pest control, harvesting and storage, etc., etc. Now the objectives for this class are to help you to grow quality fruit for your own use, whether it's fresh eating or processing. Now, when people used to come into my office to ask questions about starting their own orchard, I started off with a few questions. First of all, I wanted to know what their objectives were and the reasons why they were growing it. And there are a number of different reasons why people would grow their own fruit. One would be the challenge. It's not like planting some marigolds and giving them some water every now and then, a little bit of fertilizer, and for the rest of the season you don't have to do much of anything. There are many things that have to be considered when you're starting your own orchard. Location is important. Also worrying about animals consuming your, your produce, insects. There's situations in terms of trying to establish the tree in terms of its training process, maintaining the training process through pruning, cultural things like, as I mentioned earlier, how to fertilize the trees, how to keep the weeds under control. There's so many different things. So it's a challenge. And when you're growing fruit, it's not the sort of thing where you just put those trees in the ground and then you come back and harvest a little bit later. There is something to do just about all the time during the year. So it is a bit of a commitment as well as a challenge. Another thing or another reason why people like to grow their own fruits is they can determine what quality the fruits are going to be. And an example of that is there are so many times I go to the grocery store and I taste apples or peaches or other things and they just aren't very good. I know what they should taste like because I grow tree ripened fruit right in my own backyard. But in the off season, of course, I might, but most likely I won't, buy any of this produce in the stores because uh, it just doesn't taste very good. Many times children don't like to eat their fruit because it's not good tasting at all. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we sell a, a type of apple called Empire, which is a cross between Golden or Red Delicious and Macintosh. And um, if it's a good year, they get a nice dark burgundy red and they get to be quite sweet. And it's considered an, uh, an apple that is for fresh eating. And we sold a half bushel to one of my wife's friends at uh, a local hospital. Uh, she's a nurse at the time. And she took this half bushel home to her daughter and she ate the whole half bushel. Now, most people will say, what's the big deal about that? Well, she didn't like apples. And the reason she didn't like apples is she was used to getting apples at the lunch program at school or um, you know, out of some grocery stores, things of that sort, and they just weren't very sweet at all. What we do in our orchard is we allow them to naturally tree ripen to the point where when we make applesauce, we don't even need to add extra sugar because the sugar content is already so high. Now, there is a, a trade-off there because you have to use that fruit almost immediately. It does not store very well. And that's one of the reasons why uh, fruit is picked earlier because it ships better and it stores longer, especially if you're going to put apples into something called controlled atmosphere storage. So she ate all these apples and she did not think they were apples because of how different they tasted. Now, I don't know why that's the case because it looked like an apple, but uh, she just was amazed at the quality of the fruit. 
So you get to decide that. And to eat a tree ripened peach is just wonderful in terms of its sweetness and the development of the full flavors that those fruits are able to have. Another thing you can decide on is how much do you want to spray your fruit? For instance, I bet you don't know, some of you might know, that about 75% of pesticides applied to fruit are for cosmetic reasons, which means it's there to make it look good. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important because it stops diseases, pesticides stop certain insects from feeding, but some of these things aren't serious enough to destroy the eating quality of the fruit. If you don't mind a little disease on your fruit, it's not a problem because if I'm going to be processing for applesauce, I don't have to have the highest quality fruit. Now, if I'm going to a farmer's market, as you well know, when people go to the grocery store, they're looking at the best produce. They tend to put things down that have nicks and bruises and cuts and tears and uh, disease or whatever the case may be. So we're all trying to pick the best quality produce. And in order to get that, growers have to spray a little bit more. Now, it depends on where you are in the country. For instance, Michigan is a very humid state and uh, we have to spray a little bit more than say a place like Colorado or maybe even Washington State because uh, with lower humidity levels you will have lower disease pressure. So when you're growing your own fruit you get to decide what and how much is sprayed on it and we'll talk about those options because some people like to grow things organically some will use conventional uh, products plus organic some will use conventional products alone and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we deal with pest control. But you get to decide what is put on your fruit. Another important opportunity when you grow your own fruit is to teach your children where food comes from. I used to do programs for elementary school children and I would talk to them about where food came from and many kids did not connect potato chips with potatoes and they didn't know that they grew underground. When you have a little backyard kitchen orchard you can show the children how these things are grown and all the things that have to happen like pollination and proper water and all, all of those different things and how long you have to wait in order to get an apple from the time that the trees bloom until the time the apples are ready to pick. And children will learn not only a new appreciation for the food production system and farmers, but they will also learn how to take care of themselves. Because most, if not all, animals need three basic things, food, water and shelter. Growing your own food is a good skill to have because you never know when the supply of food might be interrupted. We experienced this somewhat in the pandemic with COVID. It's still going on at the time I started this filming. But if you can grow most of what you need in your backyard or at least a substantial amount and you're able to process it by canning or freezing or uh, drying then at least you'll have some food available to you and you'll have better nutrition than if you're forced to just eat beans all the time. So if you teach your children about gardening, you're teaching them usable survival skills. Allowing your kids to become video game experts is not going to put food in their mouth. Another reason you may want to grow food is many times people grow more than they need and you can use it to help others. It's a great way to introduce yourself to your neighbors to take a basket of apples or peaches over. In addition to helping others, what you can do is sell extra produce and that will allow you to make some extra money. We call that a side hustle. And children can learn about having their own business if they help you at the farmer's market. There's, there's so many lessons in that. It's, it, it, it's a whole class all by itself, which I'll probably do something on growing foods for marketing. The first thing you need to do is select the site for your orchard. And what we want to have is eight hours or more of direct sunlight. All day would be best. That may not be possible, but I'd like to have at least eight hours if I can get it. And when you select your site, be sure you look at the surrounding plants. And what, the reason why we want to do that is think about our shadows going to be cast on the plant. Uh, later on in the day because anytime the plant is in shade it takes longer for leaves to dry off after a rain and that increases your chances for diseases. Also when we're looking at surrounding plants we want to know if they're going to get much larger. For instance if somebody has planted 
some young trees somewhat near your orchard. Think about what that tree is going to do 10, 20, or 30 years from now. And it may well overshadow your fruit trees and put them in shade in the future. So try to think about those things. Consider the surrounding plants from the standpoint of what it is that's around them. You want to avoid being near a black walnut tree. Black walnuts excrete a chemical called juglones, and that causes problems for certain plants, things in the apple family, things in the blueberry family, tomato family, and they tend to uh, discourage those plants from growing in the area. Now, some things they'll just outright kill, others they'll stunt their growth. It, it varies between the plants. And there's not good research on how many different plants are affected by black walnuts. But certainly what I tell people when they ask me, well, how far do I have to be away from that black walnut tree? I said, it depends on two things, how tall the tree is and the type of soil the tree is on. If the tree is, say, 60 feet tall, then I want to be at least 60 feet from the trunk. But if it's a lighter textured soil, like a light sandy soil, the roots tend to go out further looking for moisture. And so you might want to add 10 to 20 feet onto that so that you're sure to be away from the root system of the black walnut. Another thing we want to look at is elevation and slope. It's best to put your orchard on the highest ground you have available. The reason for that is cold air tends to settle into low areas. And if you are in those low areas, those cold pockets can cause damage in the spring if you have a late frost or something like that. Now, you can plant on a slope, but you don't want to put it at the bottom of the slope. Put it along the side so that cold air will drain away from your trees. And needless to say, don't, don't plant in the lowest area. You need to take a look at your entire neighborhood because sometimes it's not apparent, especially if you're out in the country. So if you're driving on a country road and you notice that as you're getting closer to your house, you're always driving downhill or there's a slight slope, then you might be the lowest area. And the lowest area also tends to be a place where water tends to collect. And you may have wetter soils in your area. Now, one of the ways you can determine whether you have the proper drainage is to do a soil drainage test. And this is probably more important in the heavier textured soils like clay loam soils. Sandy loam soils generally aren't a problem. But to do a drainage test, what you need to do is dig a 16-inch hole and then pour water in it fill it up completely, let that water drain out, and then fill it up a second time, and then time how long it takes for that water to drain out. Now I have on the screen, as I've demonstrated this, how long it took to drain out of this sandy soil that we have on the north side of our property. But I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, where we have very heavy clay, and if you dig a, dig a hole like that, uh, it would take days for the water to drain out. And so, that is not going to be a good place for your fruit trees. And you will find that there is a difference between trees that uh, have a tolerance to wetter soils. For instance, here's a chart on the screen right now, and you'll notice that apples and pears are the most tolerant. But when we get into the stone fruits, which are um, peaches, cherries, nectarines, apricots, they are less tolerant of wet soils. Now, to give you an example, in the spring, out by one of my pear trees, um, the water will be at saturation level in the soil. So as I walk across the soil in, say, April or May, it may be going squish, 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 squish. But those trees are doing just fine. Had I had a cherry there, it would have died. So it's important to know what your drainage situation is. Another thing that's important, maybe a little less so, unless you don't mind hauling water, um, would be having a source of water close by. Because the majority of your fruit is about 95% water. So if you're not getting sufficient rain, then you're going to need to give those trees supplemental water. And it would be nice if you had a source of water, like a water spigot or a well somewhere nearby. Another thing we want to think about is soil fertility. And you can get a soil test uh, done by your local extension service. You can find the university extension service listed in your county listings. And usually in Michigan, for instance, it's Michigan State University Extension, but it can be found 
in the county government listings. It may be a little different for some other states, so you may have to uh, look it up online and call your local office based on what your county name is, and they can give you the details. Here in Michigan, we have a soil testing kit that you pay $25 for at the time I did this video. And uh, it has everything you need uh, to collect your sample and send that sample in. Here in Michigan, it's postpaid. And they will send you an email back that will give you the va values. And what they will tell you is the pH of the soil, which is the measure of acidity or alkalinity. And fruit trees like slightly acid soil. So anything below 7 on the scale is considered acid. Anything above 7 is considered alkaline. And um, fruit trees will grow in a fairly wide range from about 5.5, 5, which is quite acidic, up to about 7.5 without any problems. Now, on your soil test, they don't give you recommendations for nitrogen because we don't put nitrogen down when we plant, but they do give you levels of phosphorus and potassium. And, and I'll talk more about the nitrogen levels a little bit later. But if you need to put phosphorus and potassium in the soil, you want to put that down before you plant. And what we do is fertilize the entire area. And on a soil test, and we'll go over this again later when we talk about fertility, what I look for is 50 pounds per acre equivalent of phosphorus. And I have on the screen how to convert that to parts per million if um, you use that in your state. We use that here too. And also with potassium, if it is a palm fruit like quince or apple or pear, we like to see between 140 and 160 pounds per acre. And if you want to know what that is in parts per million, just divide by two. So for potash or potassium, we like to see between 140 and 160 pounds per acre, which is 70 to 80 parts per million. And that would be sufficient for the, the palm fruits, which is the apples and the pears and the quinces. And then we like to see between 240 and 260 pounds of uh, potassium for the stone fruits, which are the peaches, nectarines, plums, cherries, apricots. They'll also give you the organic matter level here in Michigan. They may not do that uh, as an included amount uh, for uh, other states, but we like to see 3 to 5% at least in organic matter. And we can talk about uh, how to improve organic matter later. <clears throat> With magnesium, we like to see 75 pounds uh, or 35 and a half parts per million for magnesium. And here in Michigan, calcium is not a problem. And we don't normally have to worry about uh, micronutrients, but there might be some situations where they need some attention. So the next thing I want to talk about is what to plant and how much. One of the most difficult fruits to grow is apples. And the reason for that is because apples have so many different problems. I remember having a discussion with my father and he was telling me, well, we didn't uh, have to spare all this stuff. He grew up in West Virginia when we were growing up and we had good apples. Well, that is probably true to a certain extent because there are certain pests that are native and there are certain pests that were imported. For instance, the uh, brown mammarated stink bug is imported. San Jose scale is imported. And there are a number of other insects that weren't here when my father was growing fruit in West Virginia. So, and some of these things are pretty serious and they have to be treated. So, yeah, it probably is true that he didn't have as much to deal with, but now we do. Now, one of the fruits that require the least amount of spraying, and you can get pretty decent quality fruit depending on where you are, is pears. Uh, pears don't have quite as many pests as uh, apples do, and many times I will see edible pears just growing along the side of the road, whereas you really aren't ever going to see uh, many edible apples. Um, another one would be peaches nectarines oh I'm, I'm telling you uh, if you've never had a tree ripen peach it's something that you want to have in your backyard they are just absolutely delicious and i just can't say enough about them now the difference between a nectarine and a peach is a peach tends to have fuzzy skin and some have less fuzzy skins than others 
But nectarines are smoother skin. The flesh is a slightly different texture, and they're a, a different flavor too. They're absolutely delicious. So if you're in an area where you can grow nectarines, I would highly encourage you to try to grow them. Cherries, we have both sweet and tart cherries. Now, sweet cherries in the past, I probably would not have recommended them because they get so large. Uh, a mature sweet cherry will get to be about 40 feet tall. And that's basically a bird feeding station because it's much more difficult to manage a tree of that size and spraying can be difficult and it's very hard to protect from uh, birds also because birds love to eat cherries. But now there are some new rootstocks that we'll talk about called Gisella and they will allow you to grow dwarf sweet cherries where you can keep them uh, depending on which rootstock you choose to a manageable size, 15 feet, maybe a little bit shorter. That's very manageable for a backyard. And tart cherries don't get quite as large, and so they're not much of a problem in a backyard. They'll get about 15 feet also. Then plums and apricots. Um, apricots and plums can be a little bit more difficult because it was not unusual for me to get calls in certain years where people would say, I had a really good fruit set of plums and they all fell off. And plums can be that way, and we'll talk about those things a little bit later. But apricots are a little risky in certain areas because they're the first fruit to bloom in the spring, usually late April, early May, depending on where you are. And that makes them highly susceptible for late frosts and late freezes. And uh, I would say in Michigan, you're probably going to get a late frost that's going to damage your crop three out of five years. And then there are all kinds of hybrids. There are pluots, there are aprums, there are pluaries. A pluary is a cross between a plum and a cherry. And there are a number of different things, and I'll put some of these on the screen. One of the things that I wanted to point out is they, are, they can't be grown everywhere. For instance, a number of these uh, crosses between apricots and plums will not grow here in Michigan they are zone six or higher uh, that's the the lowest zone is six which means as you go lower in the zones the, the plant hardiness zone listings um, the colder it gets and where i am is zone 5a and here in michigan we have zone 5a zone 5b and we do have some areas of zone 6a but as you get down further south or close to water you get better zones especially lakes like Lake Michigan, you get in the zone sixes. And it's really risky. And uh, another thing that you should consider when you're choosing what you're going to grow is how long it takes for those fruits to ripen. For instance, uh, with apples, our earliest apples are ready in August, but there are some apples that won't be ready until November. And there, for instance, the comice pear, which is the dessert pear that you would get from, uh, say, what is it, Harry and David's gift packs, which is like top of the line fruit. And the pear that they use, one of the top ones is comice. And it's a very fine grain, excellent quality pear, excellent quality. And uh, by no means it's not the only one, but it's probably the top pear. And, uh, but it's not ready soon enough in Michigan. So if you plant a comice in Michigan, you may, get some in years when we have uh, warm weather going into November. Like for instance, this last week we had 75 degree weather and it's like November 10th and 12th, which is very un unusual for Michigan. But in years like that, you might get away with it. But I'm trying it next year and it'll take a few years before they start to produce, but we'll see how it goes and I'll keep you updated. Now you might ask the question, well, how many trees should I grow? Well, that depends on what you plan on doing. If you only want to have some fruit for eating, then one tree would be sufficient. Now, sometimes you can't get away with one tree because you have to concern yourself with pollination requirements, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you want to produce all the applesauce that will last you until the following season, then you're going to need quite a few trees. Your typical dwarf tree will produce between a half a bushel and a bushel depending on both the rootstock and the scion or the top section of the tree and that tells you the ultimate size of the tree and you can expect about a half a bushel per tree 
And so, um, and of course, if you're going to sell, well, it depends on how long you want to work and how hard you want to work. Because, for instance, I have um, over 70 trees and it takes me months to prune them because during the winter months, I don't want to go out there and do it all at once. I'm getting to be 67 and it gets a little rough on your hands after a while. So I do so many trees a day and it takes me a few months to get the job done. When you have that much fruit, which we're talking about, 100 bushels or more, then you have to do something with that. Well, over the years, we've sold them by subscriptions. People would order and then we would pick to order. We've taken some to farmers markets. We give some to food banks. We give some to church and give some to friends and, and those types of things. And so it really depends on what you want to do. If you just want to grow a few apple trees so you can make some fresh apple pies, you're not going to need more than one or two. And of course, you can make pies and freeze them. That gives you a ballpark figure. If you have additional questions, I will put my email down at the bottom of the uh, screen here. And you can email me. Just be patient uh, because I am answering emails from other groups. I have a few additional notes on what trees to buy. First of all, uh, I mentioned a little bit about dwarf trees earlier. But we classify trees by size. And we have what we call the true dwarfs. Then we have semi-dwarfs, and then we have what we call standard trees. Now, I mentioned earlier, a standard apple tree would be about 40 feet tall, and a standard cherry tree will be about that size. Then we have semi-dwarfs, and, and this is determined by rootstocks. Um, and semi-dwarfs are going to be somewhere in the anywhere from 15 to 25 foot range. And then the true dwarf, you can usually keep those around 12 feet uh, they may get up a little bit larger, but you can keep them under control by pruning. And the, when you buy trees, they're not all the same in terms of their habit. For instance, if you buy a red haven peach tree, it tends to have more of a spreading habit, and it spreads outward. And part of that is due to the pruning system that we use. But there are other trees like the Georgia Bell peach that tend to have an upright growth habit which means it doesn't spread as much. It tends to like to grow more upward. And that can be a bit of a challenge in, in pruning also. And many pears will tend to have an upright growth habit. In addition to that, there are some specialty type trees. For instance, there are columnar apple trees, which are trees that tend to be more like a corn stalk. They, they pretty much grow straight up with very little branching. They may put out a branch every now and then, but you prune them off. And they're great if you don't have a lot of space for growing some of these trees. There are limited varieties available, but they are out there still in the trade. Then we have what we call genetic dwarfs. These are the type of trees that you would see uh, advertised in the catalogs for uh, growing a peach tree in a whiskey barrel, half whiskey barrel, for instance. They stay very small, usually not more than about three feet tall. And they're for people who want to grow something on a patio. Maybe they don't have a lot of room or maybe they don't have any land at all but they still like to grow some fruit and then when you're thinking about uh, individual cultivars which we will be talking about throughout this class there are certain cultivars that are better for fresh eating there are certain ones that are better for cooking like one of the top apples for making apple pies is northern spy it would be considered a heritage variety and the reason it's considered a really good variety for pies is because it stays firm when it's cooked and uh, you certainly would not want to make an apple pie out of a Macintosh apple because you would have apple sauce uh, when you finish cooking it but also this apple has the perfect balance between sweetness and acidity and my wife used to fuss about uh, a variety that we grow that Ida Red was better and Ida Red is a good apple for making pies also but I told her it's not as good as Northern Spy. It's, it's tried and true, and you talk to most people and they'll, that know anything about growing apples for apple pie, they'll talk about Northern Spy. But it's not by only the only one that you would buy, but it's one of the top ones. And so I did a blind taste test. We made uh, apple pies. Actually, I made the apple pies. And then I did a bl blind taste test with my wife, and she picked the Northern Spy. And if you like to process, for instance, if you're going to grow peaches, you would probably rather have a freestone peach tree. And a freestone peach tree is one that when you pick the peach and you cut it open, 
the stone comes out of the middle without any cutting. You can just pull it out with your hand. That's called freestone. Then we have clean peaches. And they can be just as good in terms of quality, but the stone clings to the middle. Now, if you're doing bushels and bushels of peaches because you want to can or freeze, you've got to cut all of those stones away. And that is simply a little bit more work. But you will find out that when you um, look in catalogs, for different peach cultivars, you will find they will talk about semi-cling and semi-free. So uh, sometimes they'll be more cling, sometimes they'll be more free. And it's probably due more to weather conditions than anything else. The final thing I wanted to mention, but it's not the least of the considerations, is what do you like to eat? There's no sense in growing a bunch of red delicious apple trees for your own use if you don't like red delicious apples. Now, if, it, if there's a market for them, and you want to grow them for your farmer's market or something like that, fine. But grow some that you really like. And I think that if you're not sure, a good thing to do would be to go to an on-farm farmer's market and just buy some different samples. And you may have to do a little re research, but you can still find apples that were grown by Thomas Jefferson and Monticello. Uh, you can find apples that were grown by the kings of France in the 1700s. Uh, during the Civil War, many of these cultivars are still around. And with the advent of the internet, they're much easier to find. And they're very different too, because most people, when they see apples, basically the flesh looks a little whitish or a little off-white, maybe a little bit toward yellow. But most of you probably don't know that there are pink flesh apples, yellow flesh apples, green flesh apples, and there's some green flesh apples uh, on the market too. And, for instance, there's one called Pound Sweet that has a slight anise flavor. Uh, Cox Orange Pippin is said to have kind of a mango flavor in the background. And there's one called Pitmaster Sun Pineapple. And it's a very small apple, not larger than probably some of the larger crab apples. And this one has a slight pineapple flavor. So there are many, many different flavors out there that you just don't get a chance to try in the stores because they don't carry them. And some of that is because antique varieties don't necessarily store or ship well, and or they may not be the most attractive apple, but they can be very different and it's worth a try. And many of these apples will be in backyard orchards. So that's what I have for you today, and stay tuned for the second session. The topics will be at the bottom of the screen, and if you have any questions or comments, please email me at heilig at msu.edu. Again, it's heilig at msu.edu, and that's all for today. This is Gary Heilig. I'm out.